wanted to lose weight for ages and ages and I like I think many people I struggle with my weight go up and and down but since I I recovered from coronavirus I've been steadily building up my fitness I I don't want to make any any uh excessive claims because I've only really just started concentrating on but I've got I, I'm at least a stone down I'm more than a stone down but when I went into ICU uh, when I was really ill I was I was I was very I was way overweight but I'm only about five foot ten uh, you know at, at, at the outside and um you know I was too fat I start the day by going for a, a, a run with the with the dog and uh quite a gentle run but actually getting faster and faster now as I as I get as I get fitter and the great thing about going for a run at the beginning of the day is that nothing could be worse for the rest of the day once if you really go in hard if you really take some exercise at the beginning the rest of the day will be a breeze so there are reasons there are health reasons but it also you feel much better and that's the 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 number one thing I would I would say you actually feel more full of energy if you can get your weight down and you know, the other thing, obviously, is that if you can get your weight down a bit and then and protect your health, you'll also be protecting the, the NHS. Gyms are great, but you don't need to have a gym. You, there are amazing things on your phone these days, amazing apps, uh, fantastic trainers that you can watch on YouTube. What we're doing now with our better health strategy is just trying to help people a little bit to, to bring their, their weight down, not in a excessively bossy or or nannying way, I hope. We want this one really to be sympathetic to people, to understand the difficulties that people face uh, with, the, with their weight, the struggles that everybody faces, or many, many people face to lose weight, and just to be, to be helpful. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this, the first of our public engagement seminars of 2022. Today's event is a consequence to the highly successful and thought-provoking seminar on holistic approaches to the management of obesity. This took place in September last year, attracting over 10,000 visitors and with much positive comments. We are confident that by organizing today's seminar, which offers further perspectives on the problems of obesity, we are adding to and fostering useful debate in this deeply concerning area of public health. What Simon Stevens, the chief executive of the NHS, wrote on this subject in 2014 remains equally true today. He noted that obesity is a new smoking and it represents a slow motor car crash in terms of avoidable illness and rising healthcare costs. It is our hope that today's proceedings may go a little way to preventing this miserable, exceptionally expensive and unnecessary accident. Now, relax and enjoy the rest of the proceedings. Hi, I'm Mark Hendrick, the Member of Parliament for Preston. I'm delighted to support the National Forum for Health and Wellbeing, which today will be focusing on obesity. According to the Health Survey for England, it is estimated that 28% of adults in England are obese and a further 36% are overweight. The survey didn't take place in 2020 due to the pandemic, so the real figures could be very much higher than this. Very young children aged four or five are 14% more likely to be overweight and alarmingly by the age of 10 or 11, around a quarter of children are obese. We have nearly fully emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic and for a lot of people who were suffering from obesity before the lockdowns, their condition has become much worse and there will be many who have developed the condition because of working from home and going from a fairly active lifestyle to a, a more stagnant one. Deprivation is closely linked to obesity in adults and children. So the conversation of health diet and lifestyle should take into account what's accessible, what is accessible to people living in deprived areas, which unfortunately there are a few in Preston and in Lancashire. 
Government interventions like levies on soft drinks and the proposed restrictions on meal deals and advertising, which has sadly been delayed, only go some way to addressing the problem. But what is really needed is a holistic approach from all key players at a local level in preventing obesity. Public health, medical health professions, schools and local authorities can all play their part in encouraging people to make healthy diet and lifestyle changes to ensure that obesity doesn't become the next big epidemic. Thank you to the Health and Wellbeing Forum for organising this seminar and I hope it will be useful to everyone watching and listening today. Thank you. Obesity is a preventable and predictable health crisis in our society. It is even higher in prevalence than smoking in many, many parts of our country. Two thirds of adults are overweight or obese. Children, even at the time of starting school when they are five or six, over a third of them are overweight or obese. And we know people living in uh, poorer areas and deprived areas we can find twice as likely uh, levels of obesity compared to other levels. It can cause endless problems. Almost every system in our body can be affected by being overweight or obese. Your hearts, your liver, your kidneys, even mental health can be affected by it. And an endless list of cancers are caused and associated with obesity. Not just that, it costs us a lot of money. Just the NHS spends nearly seven billion pounds a year dealing with obesity or overweight. And that is predicted to rise to 10 billion pounds a year just for the NHS. Imagine what else we could do if that money is not spent on obesity, but other emerging new treatments and keeping more people healthy and well. The cost doesn't end there. If you look at the wider cost to our society, it is predicted to rise to 50 billion pounds a year um, as obesity related costs in our economy. We need to really do a lot more to actually address this problem better. And the best thing we can do is to prevent it and act really early. And this needs action at a global level, multinational level, national level policies, as well as local and individual level policies. We need to start even before the children are born and when they are born, helping them with good infant feeding practices like breastfeeding, continuing that into health promoting schools, health promoting workplaces. But the fundamental reason why we are seeing higher levels of obesity and overweight in our society is an unfettered, unchallenged advertisement of food and drinks that are really high in sugar and fat and also salt that can be associated with an endless list of problems. That is the primary reason why we are seeing such high levels of obesity and overweight um, in our society. And also we have become a, a bit more sedentary during COVID and that is, uh, that is associated with obesity and overweight as well. And we can do a lot more at a local level. We need to protect ourselves from the advertisements about high sugar and fat, food and drinks. It, we need to protect our children mainly from that, but we can also make our community much more accessible to public leisure facilities, sports facilities, greens, parks, and we need to promote more active travel, more cycling infrastructure, more walking infrastructure. And we need to really also support people living with obesity and no way to lose more weight. We need to take a whole family approach. The whole community need to be mobilized to address this problem. And we can address this. These are the evidence-based actions that the National Institute for Health and Research has actually found out through a list of studies. Not just that, these very actions can also help us reduce the effects of climate change. So we have the twin benefit of addressing obesity as well as climate change. So let's protect ourselves from these unfettered ads that are high in food and drinks with high salt, sugar and fat. Let's create, let's design our towns and cities that can have better access to the green infrastructure and active travel. 
and let's support people who are living with obesity and overweight to lose more weight and be more active. And let's tackle this problem as a whole societal problem and a whole system issue based on the evidence-based actions that we, we have. Hi, I'm Dr. Adrian O'Hara and I'm a lecturer in physiology at the University of Central Lancashire and my uh, research background and interests um, are very much involved in um, obesity and understanding it from the cellular and molecular uh, perspective. Um, in a very short overview, I'd like to just sort of give you an understanding of, of how, from a research perspective, we see obesity and how it comes about and what drives um, obesity. Um, very much so over the last 30 years, we've seen changes, significant changes in uh, the levels of obesity that we see um, across the UK and across the globe. And so understanding uh, what drives obesity is very important because subsequently that can lead to uh, potential treatments um, going forward. So effectively, obesity tends to be seen as this condition of, of um, abnormal and uh, excessive fat accumulation in the adipose tissue um, to an extent that health can subsequently be impaired. And at the most basic and, and, and simple view, um, it was very much seen as a uh, driven through energy expenditure and the calories in versus calories out view. So uh, if you take in too many calories compared to what you actually expend from your energy, uh, that will drive the uh, fat accumulation and weight gain. But obviously, as time has moved on, certainly over the last 30 odd years, we now very much understand how much obesity is really a multifactorial and complex condition that can be characterized not only by this increased adiposity, um, but also through mild chronic inflammation. And this is what can lead to progression of other health related conditions. So over, as I said, the last sort of 30 odd years, our understanding of how um, obesity comes about has um, grown because the way in which we look at it from a research perspective. We tend to have two, three areas that are key in terms of understanding obesity. And so one of those tends to be the psychological aspects of psychology of obesity. So um, understanding what potentially drives obesity from a psychological point of view. So for example, uh, people, uh, researchers are very keen on understanding things like how fast food, junk food advertising has an effect on what influences someone to eat something. Um, there's been a lot about the idea of, of whether or not advertising of certain types of foods should take place post nine o'clock in the evening and um, to try and protect children from having um, having these, these adverts uh, in front of them and subsequently could cause them to want to eat the, or uh, eat more of these fast foods, driving potentially obesity. So there's a lot of work around that um, that happens. Um, and particularly down at the University of Liverpool, there's a number of work in their, their psychology department, which looks at this kind of thing. And then you have the area which is related to sort of the physiology of obesity. And there's sort of three areas within that. Um, so one of which is things like neurobiology of obesity. So understanding appetite regulation, for example. And so how that links to uh, the role in which there are gut. So um, there's communication between your gut and your brain that drives appetite regulation, the idea of feeling full um, and when your body tells you should or should not be be um, taking on food. And so any effect on that appetite regulation can subsequently drive obesity. And linked to that very much is the idea of the, the molecular and genetic aspects of um, obesity. So again, we start to um, understand 
uh, how particular genes can influence um, our appetite regulation or how our body weight regulation. And again, that's something that has really started to come about in the last 10, 15 years or so. And then the final aspect is that of the physiology around adipose tissue itself. Um, and that's uh, my particular area of interest. So what exactly happens to adipose tissue and the cells within it, the adipocytes, when it comes to obesity? And we understand very much now that um, since the early 1990s, that adipose tissue and the, the cells, the adipocytes secrete proteins, some of which have roles in regulating appetite, something like leptin. And then there are others that are very much involved in inflammation. And we see that increase when we look at these markers um, in um, obese people compared to those of a, of a healthy weight. So this really starts to drive the understanding, particularly in terms of other health conditions. So the inflammation that we see, this mild chronic inflammation we see in obesity, driven through inflammation in adipose tissue, um, has links to driving other conditions such as um, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, these kind of things are all driven through uh, this, uh, or can be driven through this inflammation that we see in obesity. So it's really to sort of summarize this idea of how the research um, aspects help us understand obesity and where it can go from there is the fact that we do require very much a holistic approach um, from a research perspective to fully understand and appreciate what obesity is and what drives it. So we require to understand what happens in terms of influencing people to make these choices potentially. We also need the idea of how the molecular genetic aspects linked to say appetite regulation um, can affect how people eat and subsequently drive uh, obesity and obviously understanding what happens in the adipose tissue itself to help understand inflammation how that can be linked to conditions and all of these when you take it from a holistic approach allow us to focus what areas we can look at in terms of treatment options going forward. And so there is work that goes forward to look at things like how do, can we identify um, people with particular genetic changes um, to particular genes that are going to influence obesity so we can understand, so whether or not we can understand that that's the reason behind a person's obesity. Equally, understanding how we can change the inflammation status within adipose tissue for example, to try and reduce the potential uh, conditions that that can cause as well. So it requires this holistic view from all of the aspects and not say the psychology, neurobiology, or obesity, um, the physiology of obesity um, to really come together to feed on into uh, drug trials and potential um, treatment options going forward. And so this is why uh, or the kind this is why the kind of research that we do um, is quite important and um, coming together as a whole to look at ways and understanding obesity is central to how we can subsequently treat it and try and reduce the impact that obesity has uh, on people across the globe. Thank you. Hello. My name is Dr. Bhuvana Sunil. I am a pediatric endocrinologist at Mary Britt Children's Hospital in Tacoma, Washington, USA. Thank you so much for inviting me to this global public engagement and educational seminar on obesity. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about childhood obesity, a big global challenge, and three main interventions that I follow in clinical practice. Obesity is considered a global public health issue. It is an anthropological definition. Uh, it is mainly based on the body mass index or the BMI, and it is a generally accepted standard measure of overweight and obesity for children two years and older. 
while obesity is defined as a BMI of greater than 95th percentile for age and sex, overweight is greater than the 85th percentile. In 2019, an estimated 38.2 million children under the age of five years were overweight or obese. Once considered a high-income country problem, overweight and obesity are now on the rise in low- and middle-income countries as well, particularly in urban settings. Over 340 million children and adolescents 5 to 19 were overweight or obese in 2016. The COVID-19 pandemic was associated with increases in childhood obesity as well. Overweight and obesity are linked to more deaths worldwide right now than underweight. Globally, there are more people who are obese than underweight, and this occurs in almost every region of the world except in few parts of sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Hopefully, this is enough data for us to warn us what kind of a global issue we're dealing with. So what has changed? The largest increase in weight and BMI has come from a combination of poor dietary habits and sedentary lifestyle. Increasing trends in processed foods, sugary drinks, increases in portion sizes, easy access to food with delivery services, lesser structured family time for meals, lesser physical activity, increased time spent on electronics are all contributory. Presence of food deserts, lack of a safe environment for structured activity are also contributory. Poor and irregular sleeping uh, patterns may also contribute to weight gain. Rarely there are some medications like steroids or anti meds that might be responsible as well. There is some ongoing research about the effect of the gut microflora, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, exposure to certain viral infections as causative factors for a trigger. Pediatric genetic obesity is extremely rare. Obesity is increasingly considered to be a polygenic condition where uh, the full picture takes a uh, proper kind of interaction between genetic and environmental factors for the phenotype to show up. Um, and, you know, uh, in general, if ever there is early onset obesity where it's less than two years of age, especially with other syndromic features or developmental delays that should always trigger a workup. There are some other genetic syndromes like Bardi Beadle syndrome and Prader Willi syndrome that might also present with obesity. As an endocrinologist, I can tell you that endocrine obesity is incredibly rare as well. Almost always, endocrine obesity that is in hypothyroidism or uh, Cushing syndrome or growth hormone deficiency to a certain extent almost always results in a, a younger bone age as well as a kind of delayed height growth. So usually it is never just isolated weight gain. There are some rare genetic endocrine syndromes like pseudohypoparathyroidism that might also be resultant in weight gain. Um, there are some rare forms of obesity called hypothalamic obesity where the appetite might be dysregulated. And there is some uh, um, data that suggests that maternal pre-pregnancy weight as well as the amount of weight gain during pregnancy might be linked to the metabolic path that the infant takes. Both small and large for gestational age babies as well as premature babies have a higher risk of insulin resistance. So what are the health consequences of pediatric obesity? We already discussed a little bit that obesity tracks into adulthood. Let's kind of talk head to toe about the potential complications of obesity and why should we care. From a neurological standpoint, idiopathic intracranial hypertension or increase in the pressure around the fluid around the brain, uh, which can sometimes be managed with spinal taps, medication, surgery, shunts, all of this might become uh, an issue. From a bone health standpoint, orthopedic consequences of excessive weight gain are many. One of them is called skiffy or slipped capitofemoral epiphysis, where an adolescent with obesity presents with kind of non-radiating, dull, aching pain in the hip, groin, thigh, with or without changes in the gait. From a respiratory standpoint, there is a higher risk of asthma, sleep disordered breathing, and obstructive sleep apnea. From a heart health standpoint, there is a higher risk of hypertension and uh, heart hypertrophy of the heart. There are uh, certain specific lipid patterns that are associated with obesity as well. So elevated fasting triglycerides, lower high density cholesterol, high density lipoprotein cholesterol levels are often observed. And there is another uh, uh, kind of cholesterol called the low density lipoprotein cholesterol and smaller versions of this might occur in higher numbers in obesity. As an endocrinologist, in addition to the lipid abnormalities, two of the other very common things I encounter in clinical practice are type 2 diabetes and polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
There is also a skin uh, condition called acanthosis nigricans, where there is a velvety darkening of the nape of the neck, elbows, and some of the extensor surfaces uh, that I often observe. And this can often be a precursor to prediabetes that eventually kind of progresses to over type 2 diabetes. Um, what starts off as prediabetes eventually leads to a better cell failure and progression toward diabetes and insulin resistance. And we have started seeing this in younger and younger age groups. Uh, the other thing I want to mention here is metabolic syndrome, where we already spoke about the lipid abnormalities and the hypertension, and the weight and the prediabetes are the five criteria. So three out of five qualifies for a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome is another consequence of insulin resistance where the elevated circulating insulin results in displacement of free testosterone and uh, this results in the acne, uh, hirsutism or excessive hair growth as well as uh, irregular menstrual cycles. Obesity also has significant mental health consequences with higher prevalences of depression, anxiety, and mood disorders. Eating disorders, poor body image, and uh, which might you know have caused the obesity and the result from the interventions that are well intentioned, are often noticed in obesity. Obesity has also been associated in little children with early appearance of body odor, acne, and pubic hair and axillary hair. Um, from a gastrointestinal standpoint, we see something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, and elevated liver enzymes are a known consequence of obesity. Uh, there is also a higher risk of gallstones and jaundice with elevated BMI. There is a higher risk of kidney disease with obesity plus the diabetes and hypertension add on to the risk. Uh, there is the, and so, you know, the evaluation and uh, the of obesity is mainly dependent on what complications you see and then kind of work it up from there. Let us talk a little bit more about management and finish with three um, key take-home points. So nutritional and, nutrition and physical activity shouldn't be thought of as a, um, a patriarchal approach, but rather as a habitual behavior where weight loss counseling focuses on long-term behavior change rather than short-term weight loss. Whenever we talk in council, we should remember not to focus on a number, but rather use motivational interviewing techniques and find areas that work well, but are also sustainable. Some of the other points to remember are to remember to speak with the child and the family to self-monitor target behaviors. So this allows them to observe their own self and recognize areas for self-improvement. The second aspect is to keep in mind is don't target the child or a single individual, rather make it a family-focused intervention, where if the obesogenic environment is actively modified, you're more likely to be successful. This will only work when there is a buy-in from the family. Um, it's important that the kitchen and the pantry are stocked with items that are heart healthy. And when these are the choices that are offered to the child, this will result in more success. The child should be involved in these changes. And that's the most important thing as well. This process ensures that the family and the child have confidence in their interventions they choose, and this increases the chance of success. Um, this means that uh, from a parent standpoint, offering healthy choices. So, you know, if we're looking for a side dish for uh, breakfast or lunch or dinner, it can be this fruit or this fruit, or this vegetable and this vegetable and not candy. So the child feel, still feels like they are under, you know, they are in control of the situation and they feel more motivated to make those changes. Um, parents should be taught to avoid criticizing their child about the weight and also to avoid making comments that focus on weight-related appearance. Similarly, encouraging the family to focus on their conversation around healthy choices and not, uh, you know, kind of teaching crash diets or fat diets is the way to go. Having social work and psychology can be helpful. Um, and it's important to also discuss if there are any economic or cultural barriers. Um, I always start, start my talk to parents by telling them, you know, like this is a genetic and epigenetic phenomenon. And this is the way we have been born with this cert certain kind of metabolism. And so we have to adapt a heart healthy lifestyle um, because we do respond to food the way we do. Uh, it is very important to not place any blame in this. I also, we'll talk about staying active, importance of physical activity, and a gradual step-up process. In my adolescent patients, I find that uh, group activities and sports have more buy-in than kind of uh, 
scheduled activities. Uh, I also focus on good sleep and sleep hygiene. Um, and I always, whenever I see them in the clinic, will conduct a system-wide assessment of the comorbidities and start pharmacotherapy as needed for lipids or type 2 diabetes or PCOS. I personally never set weight goals uh, because I feel like for children and adolescents with mild obesity, the goal of maintaining current body weight is appropriate because they're growing and they'll kind of grow into it. If the child is in a phase of rapid linear growth, then merely slowing the weight gain down in and of itself is helpful. And for adolescents and near adults who are done, focusing on healthy behaviors, a positive body image, and a long-term goal of gradual weight loss is the way to go. In terms of pharmacotherapy, if there's diabetes, I might use metformin. Recently, a daily injectable medication called liraglutide was approved in children 12 and up um, which I tend to use a lot as well, second line. I tend not to use some of the other medications like Orlistat because the GI side effects are too many. Uh, I have also done trials of Fentermin with or without topiramate for weight loss. Adolescents with severe obesity might be candidates for weight loss surgery, um, but it has to be undertaken in a, um, uh, in a very experienced center after sustained efforts to manage obesity through lifestyle and counseling interventions has already happened. With this, my three key take-home points are prevention is key, a good balance of a heart-healthy lifestyle established very early in childhood is likely to track into adulthood. Management of weight and weight-related complications has to be multidisciplinary. The goal is not immediate weight loss, but it is rather motivating the child and family to make gradual, sustainable changes. In addition to the medication therapy to manage comorbidities, independent pharmacotherapy and surgical options should be considered, but it has to be done at experience centers with a holistic approach to care. Um, thank you. Thank you so very much for inviting me to this um, summit and I hope you have a, a good rest of the session. Uh.
Dr. Rajiv Gupta. I am a consultant uh, in the National Health Service. I have done work on the weight management for nearly 26 years. I have worked in various capacity. I have worked in slimming clinic. I have worked as a weight loss coach. I have worked uh, in the NHS for doing weight management clinic. Uh, I am currently uh, working for uh, weight management clinic which is a commission service for children but I have worked for the adults as well and I we have a, a double integration program so that is adult and the pediatric weight management services work together in a vertical fashion and horizontally we work in community and uh, in the hospital so it's a tier 3 weight management service which is extremely good now I have done the prescription for the uh, pills uh, which is like uh, slimming pills in past however I think that the best thing is to use natural ways of losing weight and uh, I have actually used a unique technique which is a combination of the motivational interview and the neuro linguistic programming and the solution focused approach and that works quite well in the weight management. So um, there is initial stage of awareness, then there is a stage of them making choice, and then third stage is then taking action, and lastly, the stage of review and readjustment. Like we go in aeroplane, the aeroplane keep changing direction from point A to B. Say for example, you're going from London to New York, it changes the direction almost a couple of hundred times so same is that we need to keep changing the direction if one technique is not working use we tweak it a little bit then we tweak it again we tweak it again a little bit adjustment so that's kind of part of the process but uh, let me go through the 10 steps that I use in my weight management clinic so the first step is that we need to know that 80% of the weight loss is through a willpower and a career goal and quite often the issues they have is that they come and they say we have done everything and uh, the weight is increasing rather than decreasing and quite often there is some triggers which could be a degree of anxiety fear boredom uh, procrastination uh, family issue or something else so important thing to remember is that our most of eating is through a subconscious or unconscious brain conscious brain we know if we eat less and do more exercise we will lose weight but usually emotional eating happens and when we are busy doing something unconsciously the food keeps going into the body the second thing to remember is that body has got a different metabolic rate in different people so you know that some people eat a lot and they are still slim on the other hand some people eat less and they are still big so these factors i usually put forward to the clients when they come then this behavior uh, uh, weight loss dump technique which I use is quite good so in this uh, in this weight dump technique I ask them as a step one define and clarify so why have you come to me now they commonly say because of weight loss but I ask them to define on a scale of 1 to 10 how serious are you to lose the weight and if they say uh, any scale less than seven then I tell them you're not going to lose the weight because the motivation needs to be high for them to lose weight uh, second step is why do you want to lose weight so once they've said they want to lose weight I need to find the individual triggers. so there are common triggers and people just tell them but that superficial trigger is not their individual trigger and that doesn't work very well. So they need to tell me what is their individual reason to lose weight and it could be that there is a wedding coming or they have prom night or they have 
um, uh, you know they want to look pretty in general or they want to fit in their old clothes or they um, are aware of the risk in the family or something else so it needs to be an open question why do they want to lose weight and they need to come out with their individual reason you can help and guide them but it needs to be a reason specific to them and that actually works quite well now step three um, I exaggerate whatever the reason they give for example if they're told there is risk then I ask okay do you know what are the risks to your body if you continue to be overweight i.e. diseases like high blood pressure, early heart attack, stroke, diabetes, worsening of asthma, osteoarthritis, fatty liver, some sort of cancers, etc. Um, and then they kind of get a picture which motivate them to move towards goal. Then step four is then I ask them to get to accept that body is what it is and now I tend to set them a goal at this point okay how much do you want to lose every week uh, sometimes they say a pound sometimes two pound three pound so I don't tell them they ask me sometimes okay how much should I lose and I tend to steer away from it because if I set the goal then they have excuse to say, oh, well, the doctor said it is, that's not possible. I ask them, what physically can you lose? And a pound for pound is quite a good starting goal. And sometimes they set up, like if they lose a pound and practically work very well for children or young adults, they get a pound cash back. So if they lose a pound every week, they get a pound cash back. And that actually builds them they can buy something or have some treat or whatever now the other thing is I tell them that this is the body frame they have got uh, so quite often we know that the body uh, as we mentioned earlier some are fast metabolizers some are slow metabolizers so some uh, metabolize their their calories very fast and they despite eating a lot more calories they burn it fast while others are not able to burn their calories and they I tell them that this is what you have got you cannot change the metabolism per se however you can readjust the balance and I give the example of a bank balance and that is the step five the bank balance explanation and that mimics the fat balance less sorry if you put only 50 pound in and spend 150 pound that means you have put 50 pound and spend 100 pound your bank balance should be 100 pounds because 50 pound gone in and 150 pound spent in so your bank balance should be 200 pound um, so i give them the example i give them example if you put only 50 pound in i.e. instead of 100 pound you only put less which is 50 pound and instead of spending 100 pound you increase the amount of expenditure so you spend 150 pound so what will be bank balance and the right answer is 200 pound at that stage I ask if instead of telling they have less uh, bank balance of 200 pound they say my bank balance is more do you think it makes sense and they say no it doesn't make sense and then I tell them that this exactly happens with the body. The if you if you say to me that you are eating very little and you are putting less calories in, and you are spending more calories by doing physical activity, and your fat balance, which is similar to bank balance, is going up, that is not correct. So, taking them further, I tell them you need to make some changes, and that is step six. What changes can you do in the input and output of your calories from now onwards forget what has happened past what changes you going to do to increase your expenditure of calories and decrease the input of your calories in order to lose weight in future and they then start coming out I can make I can 
uh, stop eating whatever crisps chocolates whatever and then also um, I will miss uh, one meal or I will eat half a portion or decrease the portion size and this is quite good because if they come out with the ideas that they think they could work that is quite useful and I always believe in if they say it then they are going to stick to it or well at least there is more chance of losing weight because it is what they have said it's not what I have said then step seven is then setting um, incentives and dissent incentives for doing these right things and making them to into action so then they say this is what I'm going to do and if they don't do what punishment they should have um, and if they do it right what incentive they can have so I think it's quite good step eight is then how sure you are to follow these steps and scale up one to ten and what is going to happen who is going to monitor etc etc step nine is therefore weekly weight monitoring so they check their weight uh, on a weekly basis and uh, their declaration of what they should do they must lose the weight and if they're not losing it indicates that if you're doing the right thing you should get the right outcome and I instead of focusing on what they're doing I focus on the outcome if the outcome is not right they know if the bank balance is going up that means either they're putting more than uh, what should be going in or they are spending less or possibly both and therefore they need to readjust this and that is quite good step 10 is then reviewing and quite often uh, it needs to be a third party or third person so they check the weight and this either uh, check the weight in front of that person or take a photo of the weighing scale and send to that person so that that person and discuss with that person what incentive or disincentive should happen as a result of a weight loss or a weight gain and this is like a cycle they continue to do every weekly basis and because they have set up their goals because they have set up their incentive and disincentives and they have set up the review process or monitoring it is a self-fulfilling prophecy and it would then work so this is my 10th um, step uh, program and it worked quite well um, and I have several people really losing the weight and they can lose the weight based on what they would like and they continue to repeat the cycle till they get to a desired goal and this is a goal that they have set I would like um, to um, uh, meet uh, some of my clients or patients who are willing to share their story and it will be quite nice to see you Week holiday, Summer did fantastic she had two weeks away she walked everywhere she could get into, she's year 9 this year she could get back into a year 7 clothes year 8 clothes were too big for her it was just amazing she lost so much weight and how did she do it? just everybody were catching buses and taxis and someone decided no she was going to walk and she just did no but walk 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 constantly and you could see all the tops they were just dropping off her it was fantastic even this one's big even that one's big that she's got on it's really good and then coming to this clinic how did you think it has been helpful because people come here and say oh we tried everything and nothing worked yeah we've come to the clinic and dr gupta turned around and told us to try and get a bit more exercising done and um, some got motivated and um, once she got motivated and started doing like keep fit as well and going back to uh, clubs karate and doing things like that fine she's got to take it a bit slow because of her asthma but she started to push herself and weight starting to eventually come off after all this time so what was not working started working because she was more excited more motivated more uh, into it and then whole mind has changed completely yeah even portions when you said cut down on the portions that's been happening hasn't it yeah and she's cut down on the portions of food um she's not snacking 
She's not allowed any snacks in front anymore. No, we don't have, we don't have like crisps or biscuits. Only on special occasions. Only on special occasions we have like yogurts and fruit and things like that. So we've really, really fruit changed things around, haven't we? And this is how the 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 programming of the brain works. Because once the program is, you know, done in a different way, the same thing which you would do in past doesn't work. The same thing work and then I think you have seen the example yourself. I mean fine we know that she's got more to lose but she's just started back at school September and I used to fetch and carry her fetch and carry her now I'm thinking it's time for her to start walking there and back as well obviously at her own pace right? I have been walking a bit around her yeah. meeting you halfway and we're in your school too, aren't you? And this is a big achievement that she, instead of going up in the size of clothes, has gone a size down. Yeah, she's gone down. Um, right, so we tried on a uh, thing about size of it yesterday. Four XL. Tried on a four XL and it was just way too big. So we had to size down and that <coughs> was still big, so we had to size down again, didn't we? Yeah. The two XL. And all my extra large are all fitting again. And some larges. I mean, the trousers that she's got on today, these are extra large. And still a little bit. And still got room where they didn't fit it before. And this is again that what didn't fit before, now they're loose. And that again just proves the point that she has lost the weight, mm -hmm. both in the numbers that we have got here on weight machine, but also in the size of clothes. How do you feel like? Do you feel yourself? I feel up here. Because it's like coming off, isn't it? And, that, and I get to fit in all my old clothes again. All my nice clothes. That's it. My football clothes and that. Yeah. It now. It's an amazing journey. I mean, fine, like I said, we've still got a lot of work to do, haven't we? But as long as she's determined, which she is, she's got a red focus, she knows what she needs to do. Fine, sometimes it's not possible circumstances, but she knows what's... She needs to do if she really wants to lose it now. Fantastic. And like I said, cutting down way forward portions, cutting down on chocolate. She doesn't even eat sweets now as such. Mmm, really? Yeah, sweets. Mum, mum gets sweets and she's like, some of don't want, no, it's fine, I'll have uh, apple. And the good as there is, she's getting like Alex a chocolate bar and I'll just get a fruit pot. It's, it's a sea change, isn't it, from where? Yeah. You know, eating at getting big compared to now. I'm not eating, just want healthy food. I want to lose it. Instead of like when you go to shop and get out like a cola which has got a sugar in it, I always get like a water or a fruit juice instead, which fruit juice is still have sugar, but it's less drink and less sugar than like fizzy pop. And yep. she do not she's tend to have gone off a lot of fizzy pop as well, aren't you now? Yeah. I, I do think that personal opinion, I don't think that she's got a bit of water okay. in her legs, but that's just my own personal opinion. Through past experience, having it myself, whatever I've seen it. Mm. I think we can get there. Though. Hi, my name is Lisa Aldwin. I'm the Programme Manager for Eat Smart Sheffield. Just like to give you an overview of our program. So Eat My Sheffield is a program looking at a whole school approach to food and nutrition. It has been commissioned by Sheffield City Council and developed and implemented by Learn Sheffield, which is who I work for. It's a five year program. So it started in March 2019 and runs through to March 2024. And it has two main outcomes. We're looking at contributing to reducing childhood obesity and contributing to reducing child tooth decay. And we're trying to focus on the 20% most deprived areas of the city, although the programme does run citywide and we are working with all schools across the city. So how are we going to do this? Well. We're aiming to provide tools for changes to food culture in the curriculum to support healthy behaviours. 
and wanting to improve confidence, skills, knowledge and understanding for people to cook, grow and enjoy food. So it's all about the school food culture and how that can be improved. So it's looking at things like school meals, healthy pack lunches, snack policies, if they've got vending machines, stay on site policies, cooking and growing activities, farm links, anything to do with food, um, that's what we look at. Um, over the years, you've probably seen um, there have been quite a few changes in school food. So there's a growing recognition of the role of a good school food culture. So back in 2013, off the back of Jamie Oliver's um, campaign, when he looked into school meals and highlighted how they need to be improved, the school food plan was put in place. Off the back of that in 2014, universal infant food schools were implemented and they're still in effect today, which means all reception year one and year two children, so all those in key stage one, get free school meals. In 2015, the Ofsted inspection framework came into play, as well as the national school food standards, which again aim to improve the school food culture. Cooking on the curriculum was put on for the first time too, with people recognising that children need to learn those skills. The national school food standards are aimed at school caterers and are a list of guidelines which they must adhere to to ensure that the food that they provide within a school is of a suitable standard, is healthy and nutritious. In 2017-18, the government had a childhood obesity plan for action. And in 2019, there was a new Ofsted framework, which again highlighted health and well-being as a key indicator within that. And there was more importance put on things like healthy eating, physical activity, mental health, things like that. More recently, there have been some high profile initiatives. So, for example, the sugar levy, also known as the sugar tax. Free school meals, so thanks to Marcus Rashford and his campaigning, um, children who are entitled to free school meals whilst at school also got them throughout um, the school holidays. Um, there's a holiday activity and food programme, so again, a UK government-led initiative in which um, during the school holidays, activities, which are often physical activities, so sports and exercise, um, and healthy food um, is made available to those children who need it. More recently, the National Food Strategy by um, Henry Dimbleby has been produced. And that again highlights how there is a massive need for change, so radical change in terms of how we're going to tackle obesity. Um, off the back of that, there's two possible things that the UK government are going to introduce soon. One is a restriction on unhealthy food promotions, and one is a ban on junk food advertising. So these are hoping to come into play, um, I think, later this year or early next year, which should help. So in terms of Eat Smart Sheffield, as I said, we predominantly work with schools, all schools across the cities, primary, secondary and special schools. We work with pupils, parents, the wider families and the wider communities as well, looking at how we can improve their relationship with food and improve the food that they have available to them. So we work with a number of partners, um, as you can see here. So. Within Sheffield itself, we have other Sheffield City Council Commission programmes such as Live Lighter, which is a weight management programme aimed at um, pet children and their parents. They offer free 12-week programmes looking at weight management. Sheffield is Sweet Enough is Sheffield City Council's low sugar campaign. So it's highlighting things like hidden sugars that we find in certain foods and how much sugar is too much and how we can make simple changes or adapt our diet um, to ensure we reduce the amount of sugar that we consume. Um, Bags of Taste is more of a national initiative um, which does low budget cooking sessions. So for people who want to improve their cooking skills and learn how to cook healthy meals on a budget, they offer those free sessions for those people. So that is an excellent initiative. 
um, the Simmons Bike Back 2030, which is a youth-led campaign. Um, again, the likes of Jamie Oliver involved in that and sort of kickstarted that um, with the aim of reducing obesity by 2030. So they um, campaign for things like the junk food advertising. Um, and it, because it's youth-led, it's coming from those people, the young people who it's affecting the most at the moment. FAS is Volunteer Action Sheffield, which is a charity, um, a community action group based within Sheffield. So they help to run the holiday activity and food programme. And we work with Sheffield Hallam University. Um, for example, they have student placements with us who work with us in some of our schools, again, helping to improve that school food culture and do things like cooking classes. Um, cooking classes for the children and um, gardening activities they might do assemblies on sugar awareness and um, five-day workshops and things like that so we have a host of um, organizations that we work with our key partner though is food for life which is part of the soil association this is a national program they work with over a thousand schools up and down the country and they have a school-based framework um, in which schools can work towards um, an award scheme. So it's a bronze, silver, gold award scheme. It's got a different set of criteria for each award. Um, and that criteria, by meeting those requirements, shows that the school is demonstrating that they're a healthy school and that they are um, prioritising improving their school food culture. So they look at things like the actual food provision. So what are the caterers actually providing? They look at things like the dining room experience and the school food culture. They look at food education. So do pupils have the opportunities to cook and grow food? Do they get to visit farms? Are they learning about why a healthy balanced diet is important? And it also looks at the wider community initiative, so looking beyond the school gates, engaging parents and carers and the wider community in these sorts of initiatives. <clears throat> so why Food for Life? Well, um, their whole ethos is around healthy, tasty and sustainable food and about bringing communities together. Um, they look at lasting and sustainable changes. So instead of just doing one-off initiatives and sort of walking away, they think about how can it be embedded in, in a school and make us change the way we think about food um, as well as our environment and our health? Um, it supports schools to take that whole school approach. So it comes from the top, and everybody's part of it and it's across the board. And they have a proven track record of having a positive impact on children's health, wider attainment and inequalities. Just some stats here again about why we've chosen to work with Food for Life. So, it has been found that schools that do work with Food for Life uh, see pupils having an increase in consumption of fruit and vegetables. There is an increase in enjoyment from school meals and more children are taking those school meals. Um, if all schools were part of Food for Life, then 100,000 children could be eating more fruits and vegetables. And perhaps most importantly is the one in the middle there about closing the gap. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, we aim to work with the 20% most deprived areas of the city where it's the most disadvantaged children and families, um, and we can see the gap widening, so we're trying to help close that um, <clears throat> in terms of health and academic attainment. So, as I said, we work with all primary, secondary and special schools across the city, but we do target 15 schools each year and give them a more intensive support package. So, for example, that provides um, additional support and consultancy to help them achieve the Food for Life Award. We will help them set up and facilitate SNAGs, which are school nutrition action groups. And off the back of that forum where um, children and relevant um, staff and parents get to discuss school food, they'll produce an action plan which I can then support them in implementing. They have food for life training, so a minimum four sessions per year. So that could be about how to cook in the classroom or growing in school or how to set up farm links, et cetera. Um, we support with gardening and cook cooking clubs if they're required. Um, there's extra support for pupil, parent and community outreach programs. So linking into some of those other organizations that I mentioned that we work with. And they have graduate placements. So again, from Sheffield Hallam University that we work with, 
they have a student resource to help them implement some of the actions that they want, want to. Um, and they have me as that key contact from Learn Sheffield for extra guidance and support um, as and when they need it. And as I said, it's about looking at the whole school approach. Um, so often when you talk about food in schools, people just think about school meals, which obviously is a big part of it, but it's not just about school meals. Um, obviously, you know, in some schools, they're going to have um, snack policies, they're going to have um, packed lunch policies. In secondary schools, um, potentially children get to go off site for lunch. So we sort of look at that and where are the children going and try to work with sort of local takeaways or local supermarkets. Um, we work with the cooks and the caterers, obviously the head teacher and the senior leadership team in the school, as well as the governors. Um, and obviously the pupils and parents need to have a voice in all of this. So we do a lot of consultation and engagement with them. Um, and like I said, it's looking at cooking and growing, gardening, farming, um, what the children learn about in school, what food is actually provided to them in school and trying to get beyond those school gates and looking at home and, and the wider community. So it's looking at that holistic um, approach. So our progress so far, so um, since we started, so we're now in year three, over 70 schools across the city have engaged with the programme at some level. We've got 40 schools working towards their Food for Life Award. Um, and we've got seven who've actually achieved their Food for Life Bronze Award so far and another a handful around about five are almost there which is great news um, and by doing so they're demonstrating the um, focus on that good school food culture and I've just put there some of the sorts of activities that we get involved in so things like healthy fat lunch workshops sugar awareness workshops parent taster sessions so they get to see what school meal actually looks like um, things like get togethers where we do sort of cook and eat sessions um, pupil surveys healthy eating assemblies and things like that so perhaps the best part of the job is seeing this all in practice. So I've just put some examples here of some of the schools that I've worked with where we've done different cooking activities or different growing activities. Some of these are within the school day as part of a particular lesson. Some are after school clubs where a particular school set up a cooking club or a gardening club. And some are, um, ad hoc um, activities that we've done perhaps in the school holidays where we've got families to come in with their children and do some cooking sessions together um, and yeah just the feedback when we do these sort of things is always positive um, and it's just raising that awareness around what good food is and what it actually means and the importance of it um, and the importance of things like eating together and cooking together children learning about where their food comes from and um, sustainability seasonality all those sort of key things um, that if we all learn a little bit more about perhaps can contribute to helping reduce um, obesity. Um, just a few more things that we're involved in that you might um, like to look into. So we're on social media, so Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We do a recipe of the week every Monday, a top tip Tuesday every two, Tuesday, and a fun fact Friday every Friday. Um, and we put lots of updates on there, so the things that we've been doing, working with schools, et cetera. And we do newsletters, so term newsletters that go out to all schools, which are sort of promoting the work that we do, celebrating the work that schools have been doing, and also advertising some opportunities and initiatives that hopefully will encourage schools to get involved in. And um, we did have done a newsletter for parents too. Um, so this was a, a general kind of how to be healthy across um, a day. So a healthy breakfast healthy lunch, right? Looking at things like snacks and drinks, etc. So again, just getting those key messages out there to people who might need it. Um, we have produced, in collaboration with Sheffield is Sweet Enough, a family recipe book all around low sugar. So um, again, that covers things from weaning right through to um, what a healthy packed lunch looks like and family recipes, um, but all focusing on low sugar and how um, we can adapt recipes to reduce the amount of sugar we eat. We also do webinars with families, so things like top tips for a healthy family. So again, just sort of getting those key messages out there and just focusing um, on little things that we can do, little top tips, simple swaps, um, little adaptations um, that all might help. And every Wednesday in the Star newspaper, which is a local newspaper in Sheffield, we have a column within that where, again, we put in some generally five top tips um, on how to be healthier or have a healthier 
planet or other healthy wallets or things like saving money and savvy shopping and things like that so all sort of all encompassing holistic approach to um food and nutrition um, and getting those key messages out there and obviously the benefits um when we're talking to schools about the program and what we're trying to do um it's you know the, the benefits are vast and varied so you've got improvements in physical and mental health obviously we all know about how food affects both our um, physical bodies and our emotional well-being in terms of schools you children who are fueled by nutritious healthy food are more likely to have better behavior in school they're more likely to concentrate um, the more likely to perform better, so we see better attainment, um, and the more likely to be in school for a start, so their attendance um, is better. We know, for example, children with obesity often struggle with um, confidence and self-esteem. That can lead to things like depression, so they're less likely to be in school because perhaps they're um, victimized or bullied because of that. Um, and obviously, if you're not eating a healthy diet and your body's not getting the vitamins and minerals it needs, you're more likely to be poorly and pick up sickness bugs and illnesses etc so then you know, again less likely to be in school so we sort of talk about how um, this healthy diet has an effect on lots of different factors um, and yeah there's lots of benefits as we know to eating healthy so that's eat smart shepherd in a nutshell um, if you'd like to know more about the program, I'd love to hear from you. My contact details are there. We've got our own website as well. And as I said, we're on social media. So um, give us a like and a follow on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And you can keep up to date with our program. We've always been Thank told you. that being smaller equates to being healthier. That being overweight is unhealthy. And that BMI is the scale by which we can reliably assess our health. And the best way to achieve that is to eat less and move more, i.e. count calories, weigh our food, follow a diet, restrict our food in some way. But what if none of that was actually true? What if dieting actually creates more ill health than it solves? Physical, mental and emotional. And what if it actually makes you fatter over time? That is my experience. I dieted for 50 years. I was a yo-yo dieter. My weight went up and down and up and down. I started age 12 with appetite suppressants from my GP. That was the in thing back then. <clears throat> However, I'd also started to self-soothe with food. I used food to try and make me feel better, to help me with my emotional pain. And I started doing that when I was very young. So I went to, on to become your classic yo-yo dieter, to use food for emotional reasons, to hate my body, whatever size that was to think that dieting was the solution for everything and that it would make me happy. I developed an eating disorder and a chaotic relationship with food. But I was a home economist. I loved food. I loved cooking. I could cook anything. I cooked fresh food every day. My children had fresh food. They did not go to McDonald's. They did not drink fizzy pop. We didn't have a lot of takeout food. <clears throat> they were active farm children. Yet my weight yo-yoed up and down, up and down, up, up, up. I even went on a very low calorie diet. Shakes, bars, meal replacements to jumpstart my weight loss. Yes, I lost four stone quite quickly, absolutely. And I felt amazing, but not for long because it didn't make me happy. And that's actually what I wanted in life was to be happy. I thought dieting would make me happy. 
I thought being in a smaller body would make me happy. It didn't. I trained as a weight loss counsellor and eating disorders therapist, where I learned why. Why, as a society, we use food to try and make us feel better. Why dieting doesn't work long term. And here the statistics are really quite appalling because 98% of dieters will end up putting all the weight back on and some. Why stress has such a detrimental effect on our bodies. Who here put on weight during COVID? I know I did. Why modern processed food <clears throat> is killing us and having a terrible effect on our brain function and the growing brains of our children. I learned that BMI is a discredited scale. It's meaningless. And that living in a larger body can be healthy. I'm not talking super morbidly obese here. I'm just talking the normal obesity range. That the pressure on women in particular to remain at a small weight, low weight, their whole lives, even post-menopause, is doing so much harm to our physical and mental health. So today I no longer diet. I no longer restrict my food. I am an intuitive and mindful eater, which is something we're actually born as, but we forget. So I only eat as and when I'm hungry. If the plate has too much food on it, I leave some of it. I actually ask my body what food it wants and then why it wants it. Because there's still a part of me that goes, hmm, it shouldn't want chocolate. It shouldn't want cake. But now that I understand how my own brain and body functions, and I have an ADHD brain, I understand that it has particular needs and I have to eat my food accordingly. So I give myself permission to eat anything that my body wants, anything it chooses based on the answers that it gives me. And eating to satiety without being overfull has been a game changer for me. I'm in recovery from my eating disorder. I have a calm and peaceful relationship with food never thought I'd ever be able to say that. I never thought that I would just be able to eat food because food is food. That's all food is, it's just food. Instead of attaching all of the emotional baggage that I carried around, I attached that to food. Food had these all of these massive meanings. And as a result of letting go of that baggage, my body has released 44 pounds of weight it no longer needs to carry around. And that's without dieting. That really piqued my interest. As a chronic lifelong dieter, I wanted to know why. Why I wasn't in charge of this. My body and brain are in charge of this. Yes, <clears throat> I'd done a lot of work. I did a lot of therapy. I learned a lot about myself. And I healed myself. And I stopped using food to try and mask all of those feelings. I actually learned how to feel my feelings. How to talk about them how to share them with people, how to ask for what I needed and how to refuse accepting what I didn't need. 
And most people think this has nothing to do with food, but it has everything to do with food. I am happy and healthy in every way, even though the NHS tells me I'm overweight. We are all born intuitive eaters. You just look at young children and you will see, as I've seen in my granddaughter, that they eat when they want it, they ask for food when they want it, and they leave food on their plate when they don't want it. It's time to stop body and weight shaming in the name of health. People have all the information they need about food and exercise. So why are they not following the advice? I can tell you, because it's got nothing to do with that. It is time that as a society, we start to dig deeper into why. Why our weight fluctuates, why our body doesn't like us dieting, why we use food emotionally, why eating disorders develop and why we don't value our body like we value our car. It's time the NHS looked at all the research around dieting and stopped with the blaming and shaming. Your patients deserve better than that. We are not greedy or lacking in self-control just because you consider us overweight. We are unique people with a unique set of problems who require a unique holistic solution incorporating all the therapies that are now available out there. I'm Carol May, the Disruptive Health Coach. Not using any social media platform from one hour before going to bed. End your day early, sleep by 10 p.m. Spend time with family. Let me now discuss my before and after body assessment sheet. Before I changed over to new lifestyle, my weight was 62.7 kg, waist size 34 inches, Visceral fat percentage was 14.9, which should be less than 9. Body fat percentage was 29, which should be less than 20. Above all, my internal body age was 48 years when, was, when I was actually 38 years. After 10 months, my weight was 48 kg. My waist size reduced to 26.5 inches. Visceral fat 6.5 and body fat 17.6. My body age rolled back to 33 years. Thus, overall, I lost 14.7 kg, 7.5 inches from my waist and decreased my age by 15 years. When I changed myself, I thought why to keep things to myself. Thus, we started with Arpana, an evidence-based lifestyle program which helps you achieve what you always dream of. To keep the video short, I am sharing pics of few of our members who have benefited from our program and are now enjoying a happy family life. Mrs. Neelam Sharma from Gajrana was obese and was suffering from PCOS. She lost 35 kgs in 5 months and regained her health and confidence. Mrs. Anamika from Rudrapur was suffering from anxiety, eating disorder and infertility. Following 5 months of Vidatuna, she lost 35 kgs and became pregnant. Now she is a mother of a healthy baby boy. Mrs. Purnima, a lawyer, had hypersensitivity, hypothyroidism and weight related issues. She joined Vidatuna around 2 years back. She lost 25 kgs of weight in 7 months resolved her hypersensitivity and hypothyroidism and is still maintaining things where she left. Mrs. Manjushin, a 60-year-old female and diabetic for 5 years, joined Vidatna with high levels of blood sugar and HbA1c. In 3 months, her blood sugar levels came down and HbA1c in pre-diabetic range. If you also wish to prevent a host of conditions in the future. Namaste. I am Dr. Prachur Agarwal, a practicing pediatrician and child nutritionist from India. In my opinion, 
I come across a lots of kids suffering or from or gradually moving towards obesity. The single most important factor leading to such change in trends of physical parameters of kids these days is wrong food choices or eating unhealthy food. We have observed that nowadays due to maybe one reason or other our kids are engaging more in packaged ready to eat food stuff sugar laden food stuff or sweetened beverages or food which are too high on saturated fatty acids in fact it seems to be a rare sight that we see a child preferring to eat a healthy home cooked fresh food out of many reasons there are two major reasons for this shift firstly easy accessibility and ease to parents or the caregivers second that the packaged food is made such that kids or in fact anyone develops an instant liking for these things let's discuss both of these a bit due to our super busy schedule parents these days are running short of time always we are trying to catch moon sitting on earth and during all this we are overlooking not only our health but our health of our kids also we are not ready to cook food as it takes time we prefer to order it online through an application which might take less than 30 seconds or so it saves us a lot of precious time which we think we should devote or invest to in our professional life earning more money or doing any other engagement we never even think about the health factor which comes with these packaged or home delivered foods processed foods or ready to eat foods out of boxes because we don't even have time even to think about that secondly the food industry which is worth billions of dollars these days people involved in it put in a lot of effort and research to create an instant liking or maybe an addiction to the food they want to serve you or your kids there is a basic science to which we involved which we all need to understand nerves carry taste and smell sensation are very closely related anatomically in our body in fact they might even intermingle you might have seen animals which sniff their food before they eat it just to ascertain whether this food stuff is perfect to eat or not you might have also experienced mere aroma of a freshly baking bread activates the saliva in your mouth and you taste bread you can taste bread also thus such chemicals are added to your food stuff which create a strong aroma and our brain tends to link these smells to the taste of that food and we are urged to eat those things you might have also noticed while walking on a street going through a going in front of a coffee shop coffee shop a strong smell of roasted coffee beans tempts us to buy it So why can't we create this environment or circumstances at our home? Well, we are not doing it. We can do it, but we are not doing it because we are not preferring to cook food or make food at home. We just want to reheat it, steam it, or even eat it out of a box. However, this science is still being practiced in lots and lots of parts of the world. and still in india in most of the households i remember my childhood when i used to come back from my school the moment i entered the house was filled of aroma of a freshly cooked steamed rice dal vegetables which used to act as an appetizer for me my mother used to serve me hot chapatis and there used to be no count of how much i ate it but nowadays it's all all the food which is being cooked is limited to few steps like eating steaming etc or we are just cooking it out of the box or maybe cooking it at the wrong time mothers are prefer to are forced to give packaged reheated or online ordered food due to busy schedules thus eating habits of and food choices of our kids are toxic turvy and so is their health in the end I would like to sum up by saying or making a rather making a request to you all if you want your kids to be healthy if you yearn for their longevity make it a habit to serve at least 
two home cooked meals daily and you can see the change in your kids namaste do you know what makes us some of you might identify yourself with your physical body like most of us but we are much more than that namaste i am dr monica agrawal consultant pathologist and lifestyle influencer from india we are more of abstract rather than this physical form we see as lord krishna says in bhagavad gita that we are not this body but the soul inside somewhere i read we are made of three things soul mind and physical body how true when we are born we are born as soul in this physical body and as we grow we develop our likes dislikes thoughts etc which create our identity these likes dislikes and thoughts of ours are influenced by environment we live in social media platforms and electronic media are playing a big role an active role in creating our identity in, in their influence and this is happening not just with us adults but with our kids also kids are so much possessed or obsessed with these electronic and social media platform that whole of their upbringings revolves around them we need don't sing a lullaby rather play it on youtube kids prefer putting their queries on google rather than us thanks to two year covid lockdowns this dependence has taken a gigantic form and we are flooded with all sorts of information relevant or irrelevant we as parents are overlooking this change of behavior because we somehow feel comfortable that we are not being nagged by kids constantly or we get our own happy married time we as doctors and caregivers are noticing that kids are getting exposed to all sorts of information be it appropriate or not without any check some parents do claim that they have a really updated firewall system but i know our kid are smart enough and one step ahead dodging all these in our opd we are noticing psychological behavioral hormonal changes in kids way before the normal expected time our kids are getting violent stubborn non compliant using foul languages indulging in sexual sexual indulging in sexual activity is not appropriate for age on one hand and on the other side there there is also increased incidence of autistic spectrum disease depression suicidal tendency and inability to cope up with loss and failure the question is what we can do well i would say that it's true you cannot stop the river from flowing but you can decide the path or give it a direction we all know back of our minds what is good and what all is bad only need of our is implementation of things we can not avoid electronic media social media platforms but we can decide what our kids should be seeing or listening to we should spend more time with our kids gain their confidence communicate with them educate them what is right and what is wrong a mature person is a person who can decide for himself how his or her action should be and who knows the difference between right and wrong there are a few changes we educate to be made to ascertain that our kids are moving in right direction to become a good human being restrict screen time discourage playing violent games on mobile laptop devices etc keep our kids occupied in physical activities read them nice bedtime stories exemplify these things 
by narrating the stories from holy books, scriptures like Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana, Bible, etc. Make them practice yoga, mantra chanting, meditation, pranayam, and involve them in cultural activities. We know it's good for us, so it is good for our kids also. Namaste. I am Arsh. I am 9 year old. I get up at 4 am in the morning. You might be thinking, what do I do this early? Well, I take a bath, do morning puja with my mama and papa, read Bhagavad Gita, do mantra meditation, go for a brief walk while simultaneously do a sun bathe. After this, I go to my school and feel super energetic. I always take homemade lunch made by my mama, fresh in the morning. I love to eat it, so do my friends. I play basketball, do cycling, go for music classes. I love to eat puri, chola, samosa, pizza and pasta made by my mama at home. She makes it really tasty and healthy. Before going to bed, I read Krishna pastimes, Mahabharata or Ramayana comic series and sleep by 8 p.m. I also do a cultural activity weekly classes. Hare Krishna! So, joint and metabolic health to age healthily. Lift up your legs one by one without bending the knees to around 30 to 50 degrees and then put them down slowly in a few seconds. This exercise strengthens the muscle around the hip joint. Lift up your legs together without bending the knees to around 50 to 70 degrees and then put them down slowly in a few seconds. This exercise strengthens the muscle around your hip joints and the front of the abdomen. Lift up your legs together without bending the knees to around 90 to 100 degrees and then put them down slowly in a few seconds. This exercise strengthens the muscle around the hip joint, the front of the abdomen and the lower back. Lift up your upper body without bending the knees to around 30 to 50 degrees and then go down slowly in a few seconds. This exercise strengthens the muscles of the front abdomen. Lift up your legs together along with the upper body by around 30 to 50 degrees and then bring them down slowly in a few seconds. This exercise strengthens the muscles of the front of the abdomen and the hip muscles in the front. This exercise stretches the hip, the knee and the ankle joints and strengthens the muscles of the front of the abdomen, the whole hip muscles, the thigh and the leg muscles.
This exercise strengthens abdominal and hip muscles and stretches joints of the hips and the entire vertebral column. Lift up your leg backwards without bending the knee. Hello, my name is Tina Wee, and I want to share with you my journey of how I went from self-conscious to self-confident. I never really had an issue with my weight. However, I really was not feeling all that great. Um, I'm very much a foodie. I love to eat, and I really didn't have anything to worry about until I reached my 30s. That's when my metabolism slowed, but also I was dealing with a lot of stress. I was working 50 to 60 hours a week, moving to the other side of the world, as well as some family stress was all going on at the same time. And all of that stress and not taking care of myself um, led to this. I was nearly 40 pounds over my ideal weight, my daughter actually came and visited, and out of concern and kindness, she asked if I had a scale. After asking why, she exclaimed, well, because the mirror is lying to you. That's all I needed for my wake-up call. And like many people, I've chased after fad diets, which really did help me lose weight right away, but I knew it was not sustainable. So some friends introduced me to clean eating, healthier lifestyle, and um, I really found I had an, a joy for cooking and um, making healthier meals. So I found some great recipes and, you know, I love sharing my love of food with friends and family. And, you know, I thought I was really doing good. Um, However, I wasn't sleeping as good as I could have been. I lacked energy. I was still um, bloated and stressed. And, you know, the, I figured this was just standard for someone in their mid to upper 40s. Um, but then really it all changed. Um, the system found me. I, I am so grateful that I started in this system. Within a few days, I was sleeping better. I stopped craving. My moodiness was evening out. Um, I had, had more energy than I knew what to do with. You can see here, I didn't lose much weight um, when I started the system, but I dropped two dress sizes. I was thrilled. What is this system? Well, it's all about supplementing our nutrition with science-based uh, supplements, adaptogens for um, combating stress, collagen, the best collagen on the planet to help with um, looking and feeling better as from the inside out, and a team of coaches um, cheering me on, lots of support from an amazing team and a cut customized um, support system with uh, a company that has been around for two decades. So proven systems that address my goals and can address anyone's goals. Why did I want to do this? Well, it's simple, my family. They are my everything. I have four grandchildren now and this system has been so fantastic that when people see me with my daughters, they swear we're sisters. What changed when I started taking this system and following it and put in, introducing it to my lifestyle, it's very simple to do. My stress is easier to um, uh, combat. My bloating is um, diminished. I have amazing energy. As I said before, my mood is greatly improved and my confidence is 
unbelievable. So what is healthy aging? It's really addressing your body's needs from the inside out. I look better, I feel better, I am better. And I have a passion for helping other grandmothers like me have the vitality, energy, abundance, confidence, choice, hope, all the things that you need to get through uh, the later years in life. And I'll leave you with this. Most people have no idea how good their body is designed to feel until they start feeling better. Here's how a healthy aging looks on me and how I went from self-conscious to self-confident. If you want to learn more about my system and my story, connect with me on my link. Uh, hi everyone, uh, this is Agla here. I'm a doctor by profession. I'm here to introduce uh, Linda, who was an event director for Park Runs for almost 10 years and still continues as a volunteer. I would like to introduce Linda. Welcome, Linda. Oh. Hello. Hi. Hi, Linda. So first of all, I started running uh, just because I wanted to get healthier. I wanted to be fitter. Um, so I ran for quite a while um, and I joined a running club because I found it quite lonely and I wanted that group motivation. So how it benefited me was obviously physically from being active, but mentally as well, because being part of that community of people who all want to get healthier and fittier together, meeting new people as well, who uh, I'd not met before, but you just get talking to when you're running near them or you're walking near them. Absolutely, I've lost over six stone of weight. So how I started was just walking, just getting outside and walking. Um, started with my husband so we went down to our local park and just the fresh air so start slow start with something that's attainable and achievable dietary wise I had to be very strict because I have an underactive thyroid which does unfortunately have an impact on metabolism so I had to be very strict lots and lots of really good quality protein not many carbs but lots of lovely fresh salads and vegetables lots of different color all the colors of the rainbow in your diet if anymore I go by how I feel and That's I think it's important not to be ruled by numbers and get worried about if it's creeping up so I go by how I feel now hi there they say laughter is the best medicine I would say exercise is one tool it not only helps physical health it also enhances mental health positively let's all join in encourage each other and enjoy the benefits of exercise yeah greetings this is uh, Dr. Vijayshri from Chennai uh, India. I'm a pathologist basically. Uh, I've been associated with Curry Watchers Group for the past two and a half years. I'm basically a runner. Uh, I've been running for the past seven years and uh, I'm into core strengthening and gym for the past 12 years. Uh, Curry Watchers is probably one of the unique group across the continent. Uh, not just that it is uh, motivating uh, people for running or probably doing strength training or having a nutritional diet, but the approach of Curry Watchers towards uh, physical fitness and health is holistic. Holistic, when I say it is uh, incorporating all the elements contributing towards physical fitness. In the sense, the group has experts for guiding for running and walking, experts for guiding for nutrition, experts in yoga who definitely give guidance for breathing and also for flexibility of joints and experts in strength training with all kinds of challenges. So this group is very unique in the sense every week or every month rather we have challenges towards maintaining a good physical fitness and health. I thank Dr. Errol for um, I mean, making me a member in this group. The recently held marathon event last week that is May 7th and 8th is one success story of this particular Curry Watcher group uh, across the globe where 400 plus participants not just registered for running or walking, it is just uh, many of them contributed or dedicated their run towards a social cause as well. And the participants were so enthusiastic 
and it was so infective that we could see happiness all over the face. I mean, all over the participants. All of them posted their pictures, not just their statistics, also their pictures. And wherever they walked or ran, the pictures of forests, the beaches, the rivers, the the gardens, the roads, the trails. Wherever they walked and ran, all the pictures were flowing in. That shows the happiness, especially after two years of lockdown. This is one hybrid event which brought about happiness in the entire Curry Watcher group and across the globe. Thanks, Dr. Erin, for giving me the opportunity. I'm sure staying in a group definitely helps motivating towards physical fitness. That is the message I just want to send across. Thank you. practitioner and artistic director of Abhinandana Dance Academy based in Preston. I'm here to speak about the tremendous curative potential of Indian dance, how it can boost your immunity and improve physical, mental and emotional well-being. Indian dance is often referred to as the most complete of all arts. It is a unique blend of music, painting, sculpture, literature and poetry. It appeals to all senses of the body, thus being the best medium to attain well-being. Expression through art is the pathway that leads to wellness. Indian dance is structured along the complex lines of yogic techniques. So both in its training as well as its performance, it has advantages that lead to health in a holistic manner. On a purely physical level, dance is good exercise, which will keep you fit, boost the functioning of the respiratory and circulatory systems, improve flexibility, improve stamina, it increases aerobic fitness, coordination and muscle tone, builds endurance, it gives you glowing skin, and apart from all these obvious benefits, it also brings about symmetry and balance to create poise and build the correct posture. There is rhythm and regularity in each set of movements used in dance. Bending, jumping, stretching, moving, uh, moving the feet, heels, toes, waist, torso, neck, face, eyes and eyebrows. The dance is performed to a brisk beat involving harmonious movements. So a child or an adult can perform a dance and finish with a sense of enjoyment and accomplishment. The meditative nature of Indian dance reduces mental clutter and decreases negative emotions. It makes us more cheerful, confident. It alleviates stress and eases depression and anger. It is a wonderful tool to explore emotions. 
Moving creatively offers an opportunity to express what is within while discovering new aspects of the surrounding environment. Since all dances are done um, with bare feet, Indian dance also brings with it well-known benefits of acupressure. So together with Nritta, pure dance, and Abhinaya, which is expressive dance, Indian dance has the power to bring physical, mental, and emotional health. Learning and practicing Indian dance not only builds immunity, but also heals and empowers. Its therapeutic benefits are unmatched by any modern form of exercise. So, happy dancing. Takita, 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 takita,
Takita taka takita Takita ta takita Takita taka takita Takita ta takita Kirda the gadargirdom Kirda the gadargirdom Kirda the gadargirdom Takita Taka diku dikita Taka diku tonkita Taka diku nankita Taka diku takita taka dikita Taka tonkita taka nankita Taka takita Taka taka dikita Taka diku tonkita Taka diku nankita Taka diku takita taka dikita Taka tonkita taka nankita Taka takita So, hello, Namaste, Nalini Patel representing the Holistic Living Group. I'm going to today talk about um, obesity and how to reduce it with the help of Ayurveda. Now, I've talked about Ayurveda in one of my earlier videos where, you know, it talks more, a bit more about the history and the free door shows. So if you want to know more, please go back to that. Ayurveda is a, a natural medication system and it originates from India. So, you know, just talking about some statistics, in the UK, around 63% of adults are classed as overweight and half of these are classified as obese, which is quite a high number. What's more alarming is that children are leaving primary school, a third of them are classed as overweight, out of which one fifth out of five are obese, which I think is quite a layer alarming for such a young generational group. Um, I'm just gonna now bring up a slide which talks about some of the reasons and the causes um, for obesity. So um, some of the main causes for obesity are, you know, lack of physical activity, um, lack of exercise, overeating. You know, you find a lot of people seem to be doing a lot of comfort eating these days as well. Genetics plays a part as well. Because we're always on the go, we need high energy food and high energy food is carbohydrates, so which add to body mass. The frequency of eating, more and more people are eating more on a regular basis as well. Medication, psychological factors such as depression, anxiety, and also the certain diseases such as um, thyroid, diabetes, which also um, contribute to weight gain as well. Some of the problems that result as a result of obesity for individuals are breathlessness, inability to move around freely, snoring, sleep problems, back and joint problems because of carrying all that weight around as well. Um, and you've also got the emotional issues that add as a result of that, such as depression, anxiety, low body image, low self-esteem, which leads to a lot of, for a lot of people, loneliness, which is, it's really very, very sad, really sad. And we, and we need to start thinking about this and being pro more proactive around preventing obesity in the first instance as well. So I've got another slide for you. Um, you know, at the moment, we're in the midst of a, of a massive global paradigm shift in healthcare. Um, you know, people trying alternative remedies. And one of these is Ayurveda which is a healing system that promotes health using natural non-toxic substances, including spices, food, when we eat, what time we eat. It also recognises the importance of 
the mind and emotions on the body and how that can affect the body as well. It works on the principle of employing and bringing harmony to the body with the use of diet, herbs, spices, minerals, exercise, medication, yoga to eliminate toxins from, from the body. And um, so just, just going back to Ayurveda, according to Ayurveda, the main reasons behind obesity is lack of appropriate diet, lack of exercise, and you know, just daily habits that aren't good for us, such as sleeping at irregular times, you know, um, eating food that isn't good for us, such as mainly high kapha food. So high kapha food is stuff that are high in fats, hard to digest, like pork, meat, stuff that takes a longer time to, to digest as well, and just an irregular diet, eating the wrong foods at the wrong time as well. So I've got a slide. So according to Ayurveda, what all this results in within the body is, you know, the digestive fire isn't working properly, which which is basically digestion, which leads to incre increased amur in the body. Now, amur is biotoxins, and it what it really is is undigested food within the system that that, that gets absorbed into the system without proper assimilation, leading to toxins. Now, according to Ayurveda, the universe and the body are made up of five elements, and these are earth, fire, water, air, and ether. Um, and that's around us, including within us. Then that's further broken down into three doshas within the body, according to Ayurveda. And these are vata, pita, and kapha. And each of these doshas are made up of one or more of the elements that I mentioned earlier. According to Ayurveda, an imbalance within the body of these doshas leads to disease, um, which the modern world classes as, as illness. And one of the doshas that contributes to obesity is kapha. So that is where we're adding inappropriate bulk to our body. Um, according to Ayurveda, you know, if we've got balanced doshas, um, then that leads to automatic weight decrease and prevents weight increase in the first instance. So how Ayurveda works is it works on balancing the body. So what it does is it works on increasing the digestive fire, which then obviously helps with digesting the food, etc. It corrects the metabolism.